We're all sitting here under the same roof. But each of us is in a different world. Each of us is inhabiting his or her own space. And the details and the, the view from your space, not only around you but in front of you, i.e. the future you anticipate, behind you the past you come from, it's different in each case. So even though we're social animals, in a very important sense, we're all alone. The choices we make are influenced by the choices other people make, but we're the ones who make them, and we're the ones who experience the results. We're the ones who have to manage our own minds. There's nobody else can come in and straighten out our minds for us. They can have an influence on us, but then again, what kind of influence is that? What kind of power are they trying to have over us? Is it friendly power or not? This is one of the nice features of the Buddhist teachings. He doesn't impose anything on anyone. He offers his teachings as medicine, he offers them as tools for you to use. As you deal with something very important, again, that only you experience, and that's your pain, your suffering. There's a famous exchange where a king asks a monk why he'd become a monk. And one of the things the monk said was that the world has no protection, there's no one in charge. And when the king, of course, said, what do you mean there's no one in charge, there's no protection? Because the king himself felt very much in charge and very well protected. But then the monk asked him, he said, do you have a recurring illness? The king, being 80 years old, had quite a few recurring illnesses. But this one in particular that would get him in bed, get him to the point where the people around him weren't even sure he was going to survive. And the monk asked him, when you're lying there in bed and you have those pains, can you tell everybody else around you, okay, I command you to share out this pain so I can feel less pain? Or do you have to feel the pain all on your own? The king, of course, said, no. This, even as a king, he couldn't share out the pain or order others to share out the pain. He had to experience it all on his own. And so this, for each of us, is the big problem. We've got this suffering. We have only crude ideas of how to handle it. And so this is what the Buddha is offering in his teachings is instruction on how to take care of this problem, how to deal with this problem directly. He doesn't force it on you, but he says, here, if you want to put an end to suffering, here it is. This is how you do it. And it requires that you get very familiar with your personal space, because it's within your personal space that these choices are being made. No one else can do the work for you. They can point things out, and as the Buddha said at one point, without a teacher, we'd be pretty lost. But again, the teacher can only tell us the directions. We're the ones who have to follow the directions. This is why we come out to a place like this where we can have some quiet time by ourselves to get a sense of what is this personal space. What choices can we make? Because as we go through life in society, we get pushed around and the currents just keep flowing and flowing and flowing. We just tend to get pushed along by the currents. So it's good to get out and have your own time alone. Get a sense of, okay, where do you want to go? What current do you want to follow? And for a lot of us, it's challenging. We're used to depending on other people. We're used to depending on distractions. In fact, distractions seem to be our, one of the requisites of life in the modern world.
Scott and Southern want to go out and teach meditation. Beginning instructions have to be not only close your eyes, focus on your breath, but even before that, turn off your cell phone. This permanent distractor that people carry around with them all the time. And many of us feel that we can't live without it. So it's good to come to a place where you can turn it off and see what you've got in your personal space. You've got the breath. You've got your mind, and it's thinking about all kinds of things. But for the time being, try to make it think about one thing. Think about the breath. Be aware of the breath. Notice when it's coming in. Notice when it's going out. Notice how the process of breathing feels. If watching the breath is hard, then think of the process just that you're doing the breathing. You're going to breathe in now, and now you're going to breathe out. How does it feel? To what extent are you putting too much pressure on it? To what extent are you putting too little? How does long breathing feel? How does short breathing feel? Try to get to know these things. Because it exercises a lot of good qualities in the mind. And it develops that sense that you really do have choices that you can make. And you have the opportunity to evaluate and judge those choices. Sometimes the word judging is regarded with suspicion. But you have to learn how to use your powers of judgment in a wise way. And this, the judgments we're suspicious of are the ones that are not wise. Snap judgments, harsh judgments, cruel judgments. Those kinds of judgments you want to avoid. But you don't avoid them by not using your powers of judgment at all. You learn how to be judicious. First with the breath, and then beginning to notice what kind of qualities of mind are coming up. Sometimes they're skillful ones that help you stay with the breath, and some of the unskillful ones, at least for the time being, you can define anything that pulls you away from the breath as unskillful. Those things come up, and you have to learn how to just let them go. Because some of those times when you really will have to depend on yourself totally, when you're sick, as you age, as you face death, when you're in the position of the king, when you've got this disease and nobody can help take that pain away from you, share it out. Even though you get the medicine, there's still the weakness that comes from being, being sick. And the mind at that point, if it hasn't been well trained, is not going to be your friend. It's going to create all kinds of problems. latching onto random ideas, latching onto anything that it feels can give it an escape. And we do tend to be pretty random in the, the things we grab hold of. So you want your mind to be trained so it's not random. That is a very clear idea of what it's got to do in the face of pain, how it can maintain its center, how it can, can Maintain its understanding that the pain is one thing, but awareness is something else. And the various thought worlds that come into the mind are not things that you have to jump into. The untrained mind is like a person standing at the side of the road, a car drives up, and before they even invite you into the car, you've already jumped in. They go driving off. And it's only then that you start asking, wait a minute, who's the driver here? Where are you going? That's bad enough on an ordinary, everyday level, but when you're faced with things like aging, illness, and death, the doctors have given you whatever medicine they can, and that's as far as they can help you. And sometimes your, your eyesight begins to go, your hearing begins to go. You really are more and more on your own. Can you rely on yourself? Can you be your own best friend? The only way you can ensure this is by training the mind now, so that when you say to the mind, stay with the breath, it stays. When you tell it to sit, it sits. When you tell it to stay, it stays. It's like training a dog. Only the mind is a lot trickier than a dog. 
and it also can do better tricks when it's well trained. It can see through all the cravings and clingings that lead to unnecessary suffering and can recognize them as such. Its whole tendency is to go with certain thoughts, lust, aversion, fear, jealousy. Whatever comes up, you can recognize it as whether it's something you want to go with or not. And you have the power that you've trained to stick with what you know is right, because sometimes things are attractive deep down inside. You know they're going to be harmful, but part of you likes them. So you want to be able to develop the wisdom, discernment, to say no, and to search for qualities of mind that will be more useful. Other times there are things you know that will be good for you, but they're hard, or you just don't feel like doing them. That's when wisdom shows its usefulness in helping you to develop the inclination, being willing to do the things even though they're hard. In other words, wisdom is not just being able to think beautiful truths. It's pragmatic. That helps you overcome a lot of the delusion in the mind around the ways that you act and speak and think that cause a lot of problems. So this is one of the reasons why it is important that you find some seclusion. Learn to be comfortable with seclusion so you're not constantly looking for distractions to pull away from just your awareness of the present moment. We tend to be bored when we're just sitting here doing nothing. If that's the case, you're not looking carefully enough because there's a lot going on in the mind right now. A lot of choices are being made, what to focus on, what to do. And when you've got the breath as your foundation, it gives you a good place to stay. Because if nothing else, always come back to the breath. Or just come back to the sense of knowing here in the present moment. Be able to maintain that. And whatever thought that comes up that's going to pull you away, you say, nope, nope, nope. Not right now. And the thoughts will come up and say, either this is boring or this is stupid. Say, nope, well, even if it's boring or stupid, I'm just going to stay here. The thought that says, I'm bored. Well, exactly which I is that? Learn how to put a question mark next to a lot of these things. And learn how to be more and more at home with a breath. Learn to get to know it, because there's a lot that the breath can do for you beyond just breathing in and out and keeping you alive. The breathing energy can nourish different parts of the body, can provide a, an energy field. It becomes a good place to stay. It becomes a mirror for the mind. As Changes go through the mind, you see them reflected in the breath. You begin to see which perceptions are helpful, which ones are not, which ways of looking at pain aggravate the pain, which ways of looking at the pain actually keep it separate from your awareness. So the awareness is one thing. You know the pain, it's not it hasn't disappeared anywhere. But there's a sense of separation. That the pain is not inflicting anything on you. It's Awareness is perfectly okay. And as for whatever's going to happen to the body, you can realize as long as your awareness is in place, there's nothing to worry about. Because ultimately, the body will have to be let go. It'll break down to get to the point where it cannot function anymore. And have, if you haven't learned how to get the mind into the state of being perfectly sufficient to itself, just going to grab at anything that comes past. So it's important that you develop this quality of heedfulness, realizing that there are dangers ahead and you can prepare for them. As the Buddha said, this is the basis for all the skillful qualities that we need to develop on the path, is the recognition that even though there are dangers, we can do something about them. We can prepare. Because the reason most people don't even like to think about death is they feel there's nothing they can do about it. So they just put it out of their minds. And as a result, when death does come, or when it does approach, it's overwhelming. 
But it doesn't have to be that way. And when the mind is trained, it really can make a difference. And so the energy you put into familiarizing yourself with this personal space here is very important. Sometimes they talk about being in the present moment as a wonderful moment. It, you want to be here not because it's wonderful, but because it's important. Life happens in the present. Death will happen in the present. It's like knowing you're going to be mugged at a certain street corner. You go down, you check out the street corner, get to know it really well so you can avoid getting mugged. You know where the escape routes are. So even though pain, aging, illness, and death all come, they don't mug you. You learn how to sidestep them. You learn how to develop the kind of awareness that doesn't get clouded by pain, doesn't get clouded by fear, that can see past these things. So you really can rely on yourself. You really can be your own best friend.